it's uh, time for a new series of messages. Um, and uh, <laughs> there always is a new series of messages. And, and thus they go on for a really long time. And then you wish there was a new series of messages. But uh, this fall, what we're going to be looking at is um, uh, what it means to be kingdom people, kingdom of God people, not just church folk. Uh, not just individual Christians floating around, but people that have a kingdom mindset and a kingdom heart. And we're going to be looking at uh, the Sermon on the Mount in uh, Matthew chapter 5 as we go through it. Now, we're going to, you know, we're not going to like verse by verse through it, but we're going to, we'll jump around. So be, be flexible in this one. That's really nice. Um, oh, you are. You are flexible, right? So, so it's all good. Um, so let me begin um, <clears throat> reading to you uh, from uh, chapter 5 of Matthew. Uh, now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they'll be shown mercy. And blessed are the pure in heart, for they'll see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they'll be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's enough for today. So pray with me. Lord, teach us from your word. Teach us from this uh, amazing sermon and uh, show us how we might experience you in a in a profound and transformational way as we seek you today that's our prayer in jesus name amen, yeah. amen. now um <laughs> my idea for this message was that we would go it looks like in about 10 weeks here we could just take each verse and go through them and i was outvoted by your pastoral staff <laughs> <laughs> so um I'm going to cover those in, a, in this week and next week, and then we'll get on to the other stuff, you know. So, uh, but the, the way I look at this, the first um, uh, four of these, uh, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the meek, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. These are uh, God's blessings for uh, need, for our need. This is not something that you do. Uh, it's really... Um, who we are, where we are in our life, uh, where we are in uh, uh, our relationships, and um, and it's God's blessing for us at our neediest points. The ones that follow are actually God's blessings for our actions, for what we do, for how we uh, treat people, for how we relate in this world. So we'll deal with that next week, but today I want to look at the needs and uh, what happens when we have the needs of our heart and how does God relate to us, and, um, and how do we see God when we're in a needy place? Right. Now, um, these, uh, they've been called the Beatitudes, you heard that, you know. Um, the uh, weird thing about it is, um, over the years, a lot have been written about them, a lot of sermons preached on them, okay? And uh, some by me. And the, the thing is, there's a tendency to either over spiritualize them or over secularize them and and miss maybe what Jesus is really saying here so for example the, the first one um, blessed are the poor in spirit for there's the kingdom of heaven now I've heard buku sermons of this over the years about how what this really means is people who are spiritually poor people who you know just feeling kind of out of it spiritually and God's blessings on them, which is really hyper-spiritualizing this and, and missing the point. The secular way of this is, hey, if you're poor, be happy about it. That's for you. You're blessed in your poorness. And we don't have to worry about you, basically. <laughs> so uh, both of those miss the point. And this idea of blessing, this ha happiness, um, uh, fullness, some of a little bit of the shalom, that life is great, all those things. Um, it's, it's weird because people 
don't think of happiness or blessedness in a time when we're most needy, most depleted, uh, most powerless. And yet that's what Jesus is saying. Now, I saw a weirdest ad yesterday at one of the football games I was watching. And uh, it took me back to my earliest childhood Sunday school <clears throat> memories. It was like, it looked like kind of a Disney cartoon when it started. There's a guy and his dog, a puppy, you know, and, uh, and then the birds and squirrels jumping around. And, the, and then the song started. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Down in my heart. And I thought, oh my gosh, they're selling Sunday school at the football game. <laughs> I've got the peace that passes understanding down in. And the birds are chirping and the dogs jumping. And all these things are going on and going on. And, and I'm, get, I'm getting really into it because I know this song. I have lived this song. I've got the wonderful grace. And so, um, and then Coca-Cola. <laughs> I mean, I, forgive me, the kids are gone. What the hell? <laughs> uh, it was like, uh, where did that come from? <laughs> I know the devil doesn't like it, but no. <laughs> and, and I was there, you know, um, I guess they found the secret to happiness. <laughs> The secret to joy, the secret to living, Coca-Cola. <laughs> My golly. That, that almost threatened the whole sermon series. <laughs> because I thought, I, well, I don't want to compete with that. But, uh, and then I remember, you, know, you, you all know, you know, Bob Dylan, um, on his 50th birthday, years, which was like 80 years ago, you know, <laughs> and uh, when he was still an old man, and, uh, uh, Rolling Stone magazine, it was interviewing him for his 50th, and they asked him, you know, are you, are you happy? And he said, well, happiness is a yuppie word. I'm not happy. I'm, I'm blessed. And, of course, Rolling Stone magazine went, what does he mean by that? Once again, he's not making any sense. But actually, he was. And what does it mean for us to be blessed, to go beyond bouncing around with squirrels and birds uh, with Coca-Cola, and find out what does it mean for us to actually uh, be the recipients of God's presence and his power and his support and his love and his nurture when we're most needy. Now, I call this fruit basket upset just because um, it goes so opposite how we think life ought to be. Even as Christians, we think, you know, life goes to those who are assertive and strong and verbally acute and uh, have some resources and everything. And it's, <clears throat> and you don't think of the blessings of God and the presence and the power and the resources and the support of God going to us when we're depleted. When we have nothing. And yet that's what Jesus is saying. Now the important thing I want to point out about this is, if you take that first one, blessed are the poor in spirit, for there's the kingdom of heaven. I believe that that is the uh, foundation for all the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. And perhaps all the rest of the Gospels too. It goes back to that because if we miss that, we miss grace. We miss the whole idea of God being there when we can't be. And so uh, um, we need to see it in that context. It's really a foundational thing because um, as long as we think we're okay and we've got what it takes and we can get through, we don't have God's blessing. We don't have his support and his nurture. And I gotta tell you, I mean, I grew up in a home and a time and a culture and Southern California and all those things where self-sufficiency was pretty darn important. Get by. If you don't get by, at least look like you're getting by. If, if you don't have, a, have what you, you wish, at least act like you got it. You can fool a few people. Like I remember in LA with these heat waves, and we'd be driving on the freeway, 
in our 56 Chrysler wagon, and this was like 1968, so you know, it was a while, and uh, my folks would make us roll up the windows. And it'd be 100 degrees, and we're sweltering, and we're on the freeway, and there's four kids and the parents and, and a dog, and the windows are up because my folks didn't want the people driving by to think we didn't have air conditioning. <laughs> If you open the windows, they'll know. And that reminded me of the church. <laughs> I can't help it. You know? So everybody comes into church and, and, and broken, empty, poor, grieving. Well, let's put the windows up so nobody knows. And we miss what God has for us. See, we only know grace when we're at the end of our means. As long as we can make it through, as long as we can figure it out, as long as we can finagle something, we don't need grace. And we don't experience it either. It's only when we're totally depleted. And, and blessed are those who mourn. For they'll be comforted. Not those who used to mourn, but now everything's okay. Not those who uh, had a lot of friends who were mourning, but they were able to stay above it. No, it's, it's if you're in it right now. Your heart's broken now. You think, I've lost everything. It'll never be the same. The... Uh, life is empty and we grieve it. It's then that says then God's comfort is going to be God will be with you right there as you're mourning. And then the meek. Blessed are the meek for they'll inherit the earth. Powerless. Not just powerless, but also uh, there's a passivity in that, isn't there? Not standing up for your rights. Let it go. <laughs> Let it run right over you. Let, let life just go right over you. It doesn't matter anymore. Um, now, this goes kind of against what a lot of people believe, which is actually, you know, the meat can have heaven. Wouldn't that, you know, they'll be blessed in heaven, but earth belongs to those who are self-assertive and strong and able and can take it and can take control. The meek, they get, they get heaven. But, but Jesus turns that upside down and says, no. no. This, this green earth is, it belongs to those who feel so powerless and so run over that they don't even fight it anymore. And then, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Now notice Jesus isn't saying, blessed are those who worked really hard to be righteous. You know? That's what I got in church all the time. You know, if you were born righteous, then Jesus would really bless you. And less of all, because you're not so righteous, you know, that you don't get that blessing. But... Uh, he turns that around. He said, no, you're hungering and thirsting for righteousness. You, you, you're empty and you long for, for God's righteousness. Justice. To be shown, to be present. You're depleted without it. Now, righteousness, you know, in the Bible is, uh, is not doing all these right things. You know that. What is it? Right relationships. Right relationships. Uh, hunger and thirst for a right relationship with God. And what does it take to be in a right relationship with God? This is uh, early Sunday school teachings. Um, is basically admitting our need. 
it's admitting we don't have a place to stand before God. And uh, as soon as we admit that, then, then we are the recipient of grace, forgiveness, restoration, God's and, and now we can have a right relationship because we can't do it on our own. Now, a lot of my life, okay, I gotta tell you that, I've been, I've been a pastor a long time and my life was basically to be the chaplain to the burbs uh, for a lot of years. And uh, what that meant was, um, uh, I went to seminary thinking I was gonna open a nightclub in LA. I wasn't gonna be a pastor. I just wanna learn how to do Bible study so I could open a nightclub in LA and do Bible studies in the back. <laughs> I thought that was gonna be my life. And, and anyway, uh, in seminary I got challenged. <laughs> Uh, a man named Robert Munger, Bob Munger, um, took me aside and said, I think that what God wants you to do is do that kind of alternative ministry like you would in the nightclub, but do it in a really big, rich, suburban Presbyterian church. <laughs> and I went, really? Yeah, don't change. Do the exact same ministry you do in the nightclub. Just do it from the pulpit of a big, rich, suburban Presbyterian church. And I said, would they hire me? And he said, I have no idea. <laughs> maybe, maybe, I don't know, but I just think that's what you're supposed to do with, with your ministry. And uh, ir ironically, that ended up being pretty much my ministry for the last uh, 30 years or so. And, uh, and it was a weird thing because we dealt with the inability for people to be needy. Almost a deep fear and aversion to being needy. It was like, whatever happens, make sure you're not caught off guard. Make sure you've got things taken care of, stashed away, provided, so that you never need God. And you never look like you need God. And I thought, how did we get it so wrong? That it, I haven't met anybody yet who doesn't believe that Jesus was a good teacher, even if they don't think he was the Lord God Almighty, you know. If he doesn't know, they know nothing about Jesus, they all say, well, at least he was a good teacher, right? Well, I look at this and go, what's good about this? Nobody has taken this seriously ever in hundreds of years, particularly in the church. This is not the way we look at things. It's actually just the opposite. And so he turns the world's values upside down, which actually have become the values of the church. How do we live if what Jesus is saying is true? How do we live? What difference does that make? Our natural assumption that, uh, you know, we're blessed if we're rich, successful, happy, strong, forceful, self-satisfied. If that's not true, how are we going to live? Well, I think first of all we have to realize that um, God is not afraid of our emptiness. He's not afraid of our weakness. We don't have to protect his reputation by pretending everything's okay. C.S. Lewis had this great insight. Uh, God wants his children to learn to walk. So he takes away his hand and pulls back. Now we feel God pulling back on our life and we think, why is he deserting us? Why is he leaving us like that? Why is he leaving us to struggle? It doesn't make sense. But it's because he wants us to learn to walk and he wants us to willingly walk toward him. In order for that to happen, he cannot control us like robots because he wants his children to walk. He takes away his hand. If only the will to walk is there, he is pleased with their stumbles. Hear that? He wants us to walk towards him. He wants us to depend on him. He wants us to draw our very life from him. And if we stumble, he's pleased because it means we're walking towards him. Right? But we've 
all stumble. And sometimes we've hidden them. But I've never thought about God being pleased with my stumbles. Mm -hmm. I thought he was pleased as I slowed down the stumbles. I missed it. Right? But I don't think he's surprised. Now, um, Psalm 37, let's see if I find it here. Thirty-seven, uh, verse five. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in Him, and He'll do this. This is what He'll do. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, the justice of your cause like a noonday sun. Be still before the Lord, and wait patiently for Him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger. Turn from wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. For evil people will be cut off. But those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. Back to the meek will inherit the earth. If your hope is in the Lord, then he will be there for us. And, and there's, a, there's a Christ rootedness that can take place in our lives. And that's what I want us to discover as we go forward in the weeks ahead about being kingdom people. What is it that we become rooted in Christ so much that it changes the way that we, that we see our lives and we see the people around us? And I gotta tell you, um, uh, I grew up in a time in, in California, of course, always California, you know. But um, they passed a law in which they uh, made one of the number one goals of education to build self-esteem. You know, it's a good idea, right? Uh, the self-esteem law. And, uh, and then I thought, wait a minute, self-esteem? And then there, there were all these books that came out about self-talk. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you got bad self-talk, you know? You're being negative. And uh, put, put little notes on your bathroom mirror to give yourself a good self-talking in the morning. Or, uh, make a tape for yourself, play it in the car to man to work. I am beautiful, I am strong, <laughs> I am healthy, I am me, you know. And, uh, you know, drive it along, <laughs> listen to that. And, uh, and then that moved in, we had self-justification. There's a good theological word, but it's self-justification, which means if we can come up with an excuse, if we can come up with a reason, if we can find someone to blame, we're justified. Self-justification. And then, of course, we became self-centered. <clears throat> now that goes from California all the way up to uh, Seattle, Northwest, because now we're centered. Um, but we're self-centered. It's really about us getting what we want. And then, uh, of course, in my family, we were self-made. I was really trained to be self-made. Don't ask for help. Don't need help. Don't need anybody. You can do this. Figure it out. That was the number one lesson for my dad. You figure it out. And then I hear myself saying that, you know, to Eileen and Damien. <laughs> well, you know how effective that is? Not much. Okay. <laughs> but, we, but we go from the self-esteem to, to uh, self-talk to self-justification, self-centered, self-made. We can make the list longer and longer, can't we? It goes on and on. And all of it is the opposite of what Jesus is saying. What if we were Christ-centered? What if we were justified by grace through faith? Not self justified. What if we have Christ esteem? That we actually saw ourselves loved, valued by God. I remember uh, Lloyd Ogilvy, when he was the chaplain of the U.S. Senate, said the people's problem is they're always trying to love God more and they need to let God love them. Because that's the root, that's the core. And what if we were, what if we were made by God instead of self-made? It would change everything. I uh, 
was thinking about this, and I thought, I want to remind, just to let you know this is historical. I went up in the attic <laughs> here at the church. You didn't know there's an attic up there. Just past the square there in the ceiling where the uh, mirror ball came down in the dance hall and they shut the lights on. I mean, this was a dance hall. <laughs> Sorry, you folks at home can't see that. <laughs> but I went up there, I got this old, old hymnal. And the words are um, old, obviously, but the thoughts are incredibly profound and they fit <coughs> for this uh, teaching that Jesus has. Listen to the words of this hymn. He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labors increase. He, to added affliction, he addeth his mercy. To multiplied trials, his multiplied peace. His love has no limit, his grace has no measure, his power has no boundary known unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. Now hear this. When we've exhausted the store of endurance, when our strength has failed ere the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving is only begun. His love has no limit. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundary known unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth and giveth again. Let him do that for you. Let him do that for you today. Lord, be Lord of our life. Come in. Help us to be filled with you and not filled with ourself. Show us your love. Help us to experience it deep down. Help us to see our poverty, our grief, our weakness, our hungers in a new light. In the light that you shine. We'll give you the glory. Amen.